I just want to first thank your comments on things like political correctness and the obsession of certain elements of the left on campuses to screen out discourse, because I genuinely think that is an issue and problem in status quo. But following on from that, I just want to pick your thoughts on what you say about freedom of speech and discussions in general, right? Because you basically flag that, I think, in your answers just then, that freedom of speech has an instrumental purpose. It's there to help us find truth, correct me if I'm wrong, to, to identify the correctness or the logos against the possible consequence of blood and death. So here's the question, right? If I, as an individual, am affected by discourse in a way that doesn't cause physical violence, so you, that's not bound by hate speech laws and whatnot, but makes me feel so deeply uncomfortable that I don't belong to society or this community. Or when I say something, whatever, whenever I try to say something, I'm ridiculed because of my race, the way I talk, or my gender, or the way I behave. Then surely that means that my valuable insight to contribute towards locals, towards the pursuit of truth, is shut out by other people's more vociferous speech and more dominant speech. And this is what we see in cases of campuses, whether it be from the right or the left, of people using very violent and loud language to drown out dissent, to drown out those who oppose them on campuses, in society and whatnot. From Donald Trump to people in Swarthmore, we've seen this happen. So wouldn't you say that the attempt to claw back or, or the right of freedom of speech isn't so far absolute as instrumental? And based on that, therefore, there are some cases where freedom of speech of some individuals can be curtailed if we want to get the better appreciation of the Logos and a better inclusion of more voices that are currently being shut out as a result of the extremity and radicalism of those select few. Wouldn't you say that's the case? Thank you. Well, well there's a very simple answer to that, which is yes, <laughs> but I'll elaborate. I mean, the first thing is, like, I'm not an admirer of hate speech laws. But that doesn't mean that I'm naive enough to think that there's no such thing as hate speech. So obviously, if you've ever been involved in an extremely serious argument, you know perfectly well that there's such a thing as hate speech, because you've probably uttered some. So, you know, so, and, and, and there's, there's also no doubt that there are forms of speech that are utterly reprehensible, and some of those are actually already punished by law. You can't incite to violence, you can't libel someone, right? So, so we have some restrictions already on what's acceptable discourse. Um, whether it's the case, typically speaking, that some people have more privileged access to free speech than others, well, that's obviously the case. I mean, that's part of, that's part of power. And power is one of the means by which people climb hierarchies, although the more you can climb a hierarchy by exercising power, the more that's an indication of the fact that that hierarchy has become corrupt. So there's no doubt that these structural impediments to the free exchange of discourse exist. There's also no doubt, as you already laid out, that that's not in everyone's best interest, because what you want, if you have any sense in your society, and this is also why I think that we've put proper emphasis on the sovereignty of the individual, is that you want everyone's logos to have the opportunity to clarify the unknown and reconstitute the world. And if you shut that down, then you risk getting access to the unique insights that that individual might bring. Okay, so I agree with your diagnosis completely. And, and, I, and, and I think that, you know, even, even in the West, to ignore the fact that many of our hierarchies tilt towards tyranny and that prejudice still exists in multiple forms is a mistake, although it's only one factor among many and shouldn't be identified as the, as the primary causal determinant of each individual's life. I think that's, that's a dreadful error. The question is, what do you do about it? And the devil's in the details. And as I said already, I'm not an admirer, for example, of hate speech laws, even though there's plenty of hateful speech, because I think the best thing to do is to leave free speech alone as much as you possibly can not because that will result in the perfect conditions for free speech, but because anything else that you're likely to do is going to make it worse rather than better. And so that's how it looks to me. Can I just follow up? Very quickly. <clears throat> so, uh just want to pick your brains on hate speech laws because it seems that you agree that the pursuit of logos and logic and some sort of achievement of individualization, individual autonomy that is, is the end goal of discussion here, right? So let's assume, like, correct me if I'm wrong again, that's the end objective. Here's the thing, it seems no, that- I wouldn't say that exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that exactly. I think, that's, I think that's too individualistic. I would say that what you want is two things happening simultaneously, is that you want to maximize individual development but you want to do that in a way that brings the, 
the greatest amount of harmony simultaneously possible to the familial unit and also to the broader social unit. So those things, those interests have to be stacked. It's like what's best for you, but that's also in a manner that's best for your family and for your community. So it's, it's not purely individual. So, so on that basis of achieving communal harmony and individual freedom at the same time, wouldn't you say that there are certain forms of free speech or hate speech that are so vehement and so dedignifying that it disrupts both local harmony within communities, but also makes individuals feel as if they can't really engage in retaliatory, you know, clarificatory discourse against them because they fear the potential repercussions. Even if it doesn't lead to violence, they just fear it so much that it might irrationally or rationally even drive them oh, to Oh, it happens, it happens all the time. It, it, in fact, it's the standard, it's the standard situation. You know, if you look across the world, most societies don't do a good job of either promoting or allowing free speech. It's a, I don't know how we ever managed it. It's so unlikely because it's so, it's so hard on people and hard on those who occupy positions of power in tyrannical hierarchies that I can't, I can't believe that any society's ever managed to figure it out at all. So those dangers are always there. And, and, and I also think the, the highest likelihood often is that societies that do put high value on free speech will lose that because it's so difficult to maintain. So, but with regards to hate speech, for example, let's say that things would be much better if there was less hateful speech. It's like, seems highly probable to me, especially if you look at the more egregious forms of hateful speech. How best to regulate it? Well, my sense is, is you let those who wish to utter hateful things do so and let everyone hear them because that's the best way to ensure that what they're saying will be understood and rejected. Now, in order to posit that, you have to assume that the, the population composed of sovereign individuals is wiser than it is foolish. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a tight... That's a hope. You might think about it as an axiom of faith, but I do believe it to be the case. I think that if you, if you put the evidence in front of people, by and large, they will do the right thing. I think that if you, if you, the problem with regulating hate speech, it's very simple. Who defines hate? And the answer to that is, over any reasonable period of time, exactly the people you would least want to have define hate. And so the consequences of the regulation become in, in, incalculably worse as a problem than the problem that they were designed to deal with. To think otherwise is to think in a sort of utopian manner. It's like, well, we have a problem, hate speech. Well, we can come up with a solution and there will be no problems with that solution. It's like, no. <laughs> no, no, that isn't how the world works. You know, when I'm negotiating with my clinical clients, one of the things I always tell them is, often, because they're in difficult circumstances, and often not for psychological reasons, it's like, no, you don't understand. You're screwed both ways. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have an option here where you're not going to suffer. That's, that, that's what it means to be in a bad situation. You're going to pay a price both ways. You can pick your price. Okay, so we're going to have hate speech or we're going to have the consequences of the arbitrary regulation of hate speech. Well, I know what the consequences are of the arbitrary regulation of hate speech, is that things get a lot worse because hate's very difficult to define. And that's actually a real problem when you're trying to regulate it because you have to be able to define it. And we're already at a point where, well, you made someone uncomfortable. Why isn't that hate speech? Yeah. I mean, I was basically asked that by one, of your, by one of your most outstanding journalists, or your most popular journalists. <laughs> well, why should you have the right to say something that's offensive? It's like... <laughs> we, can, we can think that through. Let's think that through for a minute. So, I mean, my repose to her, essentially, although this wasn't directly it, was that's not a very smart question for a journalist to be asking, right? <laughs> because of all people who should never ask that question would be stand-up comics, <laughs> right, and journalists. 
because that's all they ever do. That's what it means to be a journalist, is to ask a question that's going to be offensive to someone. Who the hell wants to hear about what you've discovered unless it's about something contentious and important? So it was, it was a jaw-dropping question as far as I was concerned. And the fact that it was a jaw-dropping question was part of the reason why that video went viral. Okay, so now let's think about offensiveness as part of hate. Okay, so the first thing we might say is that you really need to think when you have a difficult problem. And a difficult problem is one where there's something at stake. It might be your life, it might be your well-being. But it's, 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 and then we might say, well, there's going to be a diversity of opinions about that particular conundrum if it actually happens to be difficult. And so even to discuss it, because if you discuss it, you're going to discuss option A, it's going to annoy all the people who want option B, or you're going to discuss option B, and that's going to annoy all the people that want option A, and maybe there's 10 options. So if you're going to discuss anything of any real significance whatsoever, you're going to make people hot under the collar, and you're going to risk offending them. Okay, so what, you just stop talking about difficult things? The answer to that is yes, and that's what's happening. But then there's another problem, which is there isn't anything I could conceivably say about anything that isn't going to offend someone if the crowd is lar large enough. So you might say, well, if you're talking to two people, you can't offend one of them. So you don't get to offend 50% of the population. It's like, okay, let's say I'm talking to a thousand people. And one person finds what I'm saying offensive. Say, well, that's hateful. It's like, well, that's one in a thousand. So should I stop? What if it's one in 10,000 or one in a million? Like, where's the cutoff? And you might think, well, we'll work that out. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't get it. The devil's in the details. You work it out now when you formulate your restrictions on free speech. You don't shunt that off into the future so that it's a problem that'll be solved. Who defines hate? Insoluble problem. Don't regulate it, because you can't define it. That's how it looks to me. So you have the, the free marketplace of ideas, so to speak, where the collective can render a judgment on the acceptability of an idea on an ongoing basis. And that isn't a great solution, because we don't have great solutions. We have partial, fragmentary solutions that make us somewhat less abjectly miserable than we might be. That's what we have. And if we try to if we try to eradicate that kind of risk completely, all we do is magnify a different kind of risk. Thank you. Peterson's argument hinges on the instrumental role of free speech in society, emphasizing its utility in uncovering truth and fostering individual and collective growth. He acknowledges the existence of hate speech, but questions the feasibility and ethics of regulating such speech through laws. The crux of Peterson's stance is the concern over who gets to define hate, and the potential for those definitions to be co-opted by the very entities least desirable to wield such power. This dialogue raises essential questions about the balance between ensuring a society where diverse viewpoints can coexist without fear and the realities of speech that can alienate or harm. Peterson posits that, despite the ugliness of hate speech, the alternative regulating speech may lead to even graver consequences, stifling the free exchange of ideas that is foundational to a dynamic society. The students' concerns reflect a broader societal anxiety about the impact of unchecked speech on minority communities and the potential for discourse to exclude valuable perspectives. This reflects a tension between the ideal of a marketplace of ideas, where truth emerges from the competition of thoughts, and the lived reality of individuals who may feel marginalized by dominant narratives. Peterson warns of the potential for hate speech laws to be exploited by those in power to suppress dissenting opinions. History provides numerous examples where laws intended to protect public order or national security have been used to stifle political opposition. For instance, in various authoritarian regimes, anti-extremism laws have been used to silence critics of the government, demonstrating the slippery slope from well-intentioned regulation to censorship. Research on the effects of censorship indicates that it may not effectively reduce hate or promote tolerance. A notable study published in the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization found that exposure to extremist content does not necessarily increase radicalization and may, in some cases, reduce support for violence. This underscores Peterson's argument that open debate may be a more effective antidote to hate speech than attempts to suppress it. 